Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Joshua. Chapter 4, we're continuing in our series uh, entitled Memorial Stones, and we are uh, I'm basically just telling stories of where we came from as a church and a, a fellowship. Then we're learning lessons along the way. We're basing this uh, uh, title of the series on the scripture we're going to read right now, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Let's read that out. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, and so these stones were something that they were to refer to in future times to remember uh, what they were and what God had done. So we're going to talk now about some early church planting lessons. Last week, we finally got up to about 1974, and we started looking at the process of church planting. Wickenburg, Flagstaff, Tucson, and Nogales, uh, that uh, wound up being Nogales, Mexico, and Nogales, Arizona. And so this was, just to recap the, the turning point in our church and what would become our fellowship is the idea that we are to train workers in-house, not sending them to Bible school, and then to plant them out to begin new congregations with our same spirit and our same heart and our same approach. And so we began to do that. So once we had these first churches, it became clear that this is actually what God was calling us to do. It wasn't just something we're trying. Now it became clear this is our calling as a congregation. In every church you have to hear from God and what God wants you to do. Uh, but for us, what was birthed was a culture of church planting. And this was not just something we're trying once. This now became a passion uh, of our congregation, a passion to reach the lost, and ultimately it would be a passion to reach the world. Our theme was go ye, based on Mark 16. And let's read that, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to okay. every creature. Okay, go ye, that is our theme. That is actually the... the a foundation stone of our entire fellowship as it became Go Ye. Got a picture here. Uh, very first time they wrote a book about our fellowship, it was called Go Ye. And it was based on this because we believe in Mark 16, 15. We believe that that is our marching orders. Our choir started singing a song called Go Ye. If you were around in those days, you would have heard this. Many times we have a little bit of audio of the song, Go Ye. remember that song and we heard it many many times this this version was that's fine this version was a uh, probably 2003 that was phase one but our original choir that was sung every conference probably twice a year because that is the theme of our uh, congregation and so this becomes now a culture culture is group beliefs and group expectations. And so 
what happens is that when people get saved, now what people begin to see is a clear path to ministry. Converts would get saved and they would see their friends or they would see people they knew go out into the ministry. And this was not a theory that maybe we could reach the world. This works. We saw people like us. That is the power of what we do is many of the, this, this guy, he's like me. He has a similar background. He's not uh, uh, far above in, in education or, or uh, in spirituality. Someone like me could find the will of God, and that was inspiring. You create a culture in a congregation, and that is uh, characteristics and beliefs. And so one of the things that happens in our church is we view people that get saved probably a little differently than other churches. We're not just excited that they are at church or even that they've gotten saved. In our church, we see people, they could be future men and women of God. And this is through the process of d discipleship. And so you create a culture when new converts get saved, immediately they are surrounded by people who are hungry for the will of God. So it's not just, you know, get off drugs and clean up your life. It is that God could use your life and that becomes a culture. And that is uh, what began to happen in our congregation. So we started in 1973. Now we're moving ahead and we continued planting churches. The original churches, they were all planted very close, very nearby. Wickenburg, Flagstaff, Tucson, Nogales. Then there was Cottonwood, Bullhead City. All of these were cities within three hours or so uh, of Prescott. Then they began to expand uh, later on. New Mexico, that was new ground. Then California, then uh, Nevada in, uh, in this. So, but most of them in the beginning was, uh, they were very close. And this was uh, uh, natural. They were mostly originally in Arizona. You saw the title of the book, Go Ye, the Arizona story. What, what began to happen was people in Foursquare began to call us the Arizona Fellowship. It was a, a kind of a distinct, of course, God's location where he began doing this was it started in Arizona. But they were actually talking about distinctives. But the churches were planted close. That was logical. To you, you see every six months church planting. It's like, oh yeah, it's the church planting. Thing. You, 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 you got to think of how revolutionary this was. That was an unknown venture. My father didn't know anybody who planted churches of people who never attended Bible school. So he didn't know how this was going to go. It's logical that you put them close because then you can give support and that's how we uh, viewed it. It's easier to help them and kind of make sure that they uh, make it. So in church planting, a, a very, very simple issue is how our church, how our churches started. Some people have the idea that, you know, I have a big map in my uh, office and I call in Jesse and say, Jesse, we're going to make moves. And I direct and I say, thou shalt go to. That is not, that is not how this happens. What happened was that men were planted at first. They had a passion to spread the gospel, and that was imparted from their pastor, originally Pastor Mitchell, but this is true in every church. Pastor Mitchell preached and imparted passion into them. This is not something that we just try or that would be nice. It was something burning on the inside. I told you my father, because he wanted other places to have the gospel, our family vacations were always places where dad was thinking of starting a church. And we would go there and that would be, uh, we would uh, scout that. 
So my father would begin to speak as he traveled. He would begin to see cities and would begin to talk with men about there are cities that don't have the gospel. And so passion is the first reason why churches were were started. It was normal that men would then begin to look at cities and say, there are people there that don't have the gospel. The second thing that started happening was originally, I I explained to you uh, that uh, last week, when my father had this idea that we could plant workers that had never gone to Bible school, He was wanting to find a place where they could begin. And in Foursquare, a denomination is centralized control because they didn't plant churches from local congregations. It came from headquarters. So as a consequence, you wound up having a a denomination that is large will have at any given time numbers of churches that need pastors because the pastor retired, because he moved, because he died, because he, you know, did something foolish or whatever. So there would be churches that for a time didn't have a pastor. Remember Prescott, when my parents came here, they didn't have a pastor for three months. That, that is to us, that, that's how it, we would never do that because our church planting is not denominational centralized if one of our churches doesn't have a pastor, we are going to staff that. But Foursquare didn't have that. My father, knowing that they had churches that needed pastors, began to tell the powers that be, I have young men that they can fill uh, these churches. So in a number of cases, our early church plants were actually existing Foursquare churches. Tucson, that was the mission uh, church of the the Foursquare church in in Tucson. Flagstaff was an existing congregation. They had a building. Uh, Foursquare did not rent buildings in those days. It was all property. They all only had church buildings. And so Flagstaff had a church building, about 10 people. Phoenix, Uh, The church that now Pastor Gary Marsh uh, pastors, that was uh, originally a uh, a Foursquare church, El Centro, Yuma, uh, I believe Colorado Springs, and I'm sure there were others that, that I don't know. But so here was men coming, I want to preach the gospel, my father spread the word. Now Foursquare, they didn't plant men who didn't go to Bible school but they had a number of empty churches or churches that didn't have a pastor. So they were willing to allow these untried men because it actually solved a problem for them. And so it was kind of a marriage. You have somebody who wants to do the will of God. You have Foursquare that says, we need somebody. It was natural to put these men in those places. But then as time went on, People were getting saved. Remember, hippies were very transient. They were traveling. They were hitchhiking. They were moving, leaving their hometown. So you had people getting saved who weren't from Prescott. Or you had people getting saved that weren't, as Tucson began to plant churches, they weren't from Tucson. It is very natural that men had a burden for the place that they were from. And so I want you to understand in church planting, there are a number of factors. How is it we determine where a church is planted? We tend to work firstly with burden. And that is what, because God moves upon people. God is in charge of everything. In other words, we had people from Massachusetts that got saved here. He could have saved them in Massachusetts, right? But God who orchestrates everything He uses human decisions, and one of those is people from other places getting saved in a place where they are not from. God actually uses that, and they begin to have a burden. So as we begin to spread outside of Arizona, and we'll talk about that in time to come, 
Often this was a matter of burden. I have a burden for the city, the state, the place that I am from. And that is the first criteria that we operate on usually is burden now. It doesn't always work that way because there may be a need. We need, we don't leave churches empty like Foursquare did. So if it is you have a burden, but there is a need, we feel that the need reveals the will of God and we operate that way. Okay, so we began to plant churches and eventually this began to spread beyond uh, Arizona. Let's talk about church planting experiments. Okay, so my father has what he feels is from God to plant churches. I want you to understand, there was no manual. There was no church planting for dummies. You couldn't watch YouTube videos, how to plant a church. There was, there was nothing apart from the Bible. So you're trying to say, how did they plant churches in the Bible? So here's a scripture, Luke 10, 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Okay, here's a very important principle is that he sent them two by two. Now, this seems basic, but two by father, is the two by two speaking of a husband and a wife? Or is that speaking of two couples? What is this two by two? He had no manual. So in several early church planting uh, ventures, we experimented, and that is that Pastor Mitchell sent multiple couples. I told you last week when, uh, when we sent Jack and Patty Harris what was supposed to be Nogales, Arizona, uh, we actually sent three couples. Two of the couples were not going to pastor, they were going to uh, help. We sent uh, Bob and Cher Porter who were gonna help and then we sent George and Iris Shields. We've got a picture here, early days of uh, George, our very own George Shields. It was logical to send George because Jack Harris didn't speak Spanish. George did. So that one kind of made sense is George can go and he can help with the Spanish. And that is what was, uh, uh, came to be, was very, very helpful. So the porters and the shields, they stayed helping to establish the church in Nogales, Mexico. I told you the circumstances of that. And then the church in Nogales, Arizona, they stayed there for several years and then they came back to Prescott. So that was our first experiment in how do we plant churches? And so he sent multiple couples to try to achieve the job. He tried a second experiment. So overall, um, I think that the, the Nogales experiment was helpful, uh, especially because George could speak Spanish, but uh, nonetheless, that was the first one. The second one was Yuma, Arizona. We sent two couples, and this was not a good plan. He sent two buddies that they went, and what... Pastor Mitchell discovered is that they basically were distracted from their mission. They spent time playing and they spent time encouraging each other's bad attitudes. If I had to hazard a guess, they probably still do that to this day, but uh, I'm just speculating. And so eventually dad brought back uh, one of the couples said that's not gonna work. And his conclusion was that was not helpful. And uh, he never did it again. As far as my memory in all of the hundreds of churches that have been planted from Prescott, we have never done that again. We've never sent multiple couples to accomplish the same uh, church. So out of experience, Pastor Mitchell now comes to a conclusion. Remember my statement? Pastor Mitchell said over and over again, we stumbled into the will of God. There was no clear roadmap, so he was finding our way in this, but he came to the conclusion that uh, on reflection, we should not send multiple couples to, to plant uh, the same church. 
So several factors, let's think about this. Number one, sending multiple couples is a huge hit on the local congregation. It's fine if you're a massive congregation, you have tons of people to uh, uh, spare. But in an average church, if you're gonna send more than one couple to build the same church, that takes a huge hit that could be financially. Some churches, they're by faith planting. They're on the edge financially. So to send two couples who are giving at the same time, maybe that's not helpful. It is in ministry. We don't send people who are not involved in ministry. So now if you're sending multiple couples, you are denting and uh, uh, hindering some of your local ministries. That's, that's factor number one. Factor number two is, and I'm not talking about sending two pastoral couples. You, you, you grasp what I'm saying. One pastor couple and then somebody else to help. But he said the helpers actually then wind up coming under the influence of the man you send instead of their own pastor. So we send, we send couples that are very raw. You do not have to be polished and perfect uh, uh, to be launched out. Uh, I, I'm living proof of that. So, uh, but, but what happens then is we can send couple who, if he is now, the pastor is the influence spiritually on this couple, That'd be fine if he has a really good spirit and approaches that well. But if not, that's not helpful for the couple. So now they're learning. If you send a man out and he has bad attitudes and, and some things that are not great in his spirit, he now naturally is going to influence them negatively. And so many of these couples that are going to go to help, they want to pastor. Great opportunity. I mean, that's a fantastic thing to get to be a part of it. But there are spiritual and character development issues that Pastor Mitchell felt that's not helpful uh, in, in most cases. The, the term that my father said to me, I heard a number of times through the years, is that's putting an adult kidney in a baby's body. Right? That's the, the natural thing. Babies are small, all of their organs are small, naturally so they grow. He said, putting somebody who comes from a larger congregation into a brand new baby church is like putting an adult kidney in a baby body. So what he says is that has the potential to, put, uh, to change uh, some of the factors of a new church. Genesis 1.11 is actually a foundational church planting scripture. Let's read that. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Okay, whose seed is in itself. That is a profound... Uh, principle that we use unto this day is that when you plant a couple to build a new church, everything that is going to be required for that church to, uh, to be built will be located from within. Okay, so in other words, you don't have to bring in other factors or other people uh, to help. So especially our calling in our fellowship is discipleship. When we plant a church, we are not just saying, get some people saved and gather a group. Every couple that is sent, they are sent with a mission. Your mission is, Matthew 28, go and make disciples. So discipleship operates on connection with a pastor. Now we understand and what we're talking about multiple couples. There are churches. I read of this is, uh, yes, we planted a church. They sent 250 people. And that, that was their idea of a church plan from, uh, from the beginning. They, they, they had bands, drama, nurse. They had everything uh, from without. 
But our call is discipleship. And in discipleship, that operates on the principle when people get saved, they, their reference point is a pastor. Paul could speak to people that he pastored. He said, I told you, follow me as I follow Christ. How do people know? It, it actually, uh, I pastored, Lisa and I first pastored in Launceston, Tasmania, and and it was natural as people got saved. We don't build on, on just collecting people from other churches. They were all raw converts. Years later, when we would go back there, some of our early converts, this is in Australia, some of them prayed with a slight American accent. Not because I made them or told them that, no, don't say God, say God. Yeah, I didn't have to do that. There is something about a convert who comes in, how do I pray, how do I witness, how, what is a Christian, they reference off of the pastor and his wife. Now, if you're adding other people in, their reference point, you actually have the potential of disrupting discipleship. And our calling is not simply to gather people or to get people saved, it is to make disciples. And so as my father began to see uh, the vision unfold, which is discipleship, he came to the conclusion, I don't think it's helpful for the process of discipleship to send multiple couples. So if you want to volunteer next time to go join your buddy, when they get launched out, the answer is automatically no. Okay? I'm just saying. All right. Let's talk now about the basis and the background of conferences. This is a very important part of our fellowship. We are uh, in eight days, our summer Bible conference will begin. We hold conferences January and July, twice a year. And then this is a part of the growth of our fellowship as they plant churches and reach a certain size then they begin holding their own conferences. Where did the idea of conferences come from? So first of all, we have the Bible foundation. There is a Bible foundation of gathering. You read in the Old Testament that there were a number of annual feasts that God instituted with his people, three times in particular, set times, when God's people were to gather together and they were to focus on certain things. The gathering functioned as reminders. They're off in different cities, small villages, different places, but three times a year especially they gathered and what happened is they focused on who they are and what God told them to do. So what happened is three times a year, there was a recalibrating. You, you wander off and you forget. So you come together, you recalibrate your heart and your mind with God's will. Very important part of conferences is we remember what God has done. That is a powerful thing. You often will hear, I'm doing a whole series, but it is not uncommon that you will hear pastors as they are preaching and challenging the people, they will refer to what God has done. Not for the purpose of nostalgia, we're doing that to remind us where did we come from that will tell us what we should be today and then when we gather together, we remember our common destiny. We are reaching the world together. This is what happens in conference. Next Sunday, you will see people come early. There will be people from other cities and other nations, and they get to see a common destiny. And this, this becomes very important uh, when you are uh, isolated. Lisa and I first pioneered in Launceston, Tasmania. Tasmania was an island. There was one other church, and they had, uh, uh, you know, a few old ladies and, and I think one, maybe two young couples. So 
as I'm telling people about what we do and where we, you got to understand, there were people that had never even driven to the capital of their own island state. So now I'm te- we came from someplace else and we're telling them what God has done, but it's very hard for them to grasp what is going on here. And so we begin to tell them about conferences and all that kind of thing. This is a question one of our new converts asked in the beginning. Do the people who get sent out, do they know that they're going out? Because <laughs> they had never seen it. Like, can you imagine that? It's like you're just sitting there and they call your name like Greg and Lisa like what I had no idea no way so they didn't they had never seen it but then we're able to take them to a conference and so now in a conference they begin to see wow this is much bigger than what we are so that is the purpose of gathering in Acts uh, in the New Testament Acts 15 They gathered together. There was a problem. There were people who were trying to tell Gentile or non-Jewish converts. They said, we're really glad that you're saved and now you need to get circumcised. That would be an exciting witnessing opportunity. Hi, would you like to come to our church and uh, you get saved? You got to go. I'm sorry, what did you? But this is a problem. They're saying absolutely, they're not saved if they're not circumcised. They're not saved if they're not if they're still eating ham sandwiches. They're from hell, and so they said we got to we got to work this out. So what did they do? They gathered. Acts 15 is a gathering, and they together they established the pattern of how we're going to approach salvation as concerns. Jewish law. Acts 20, then we see another time of gathering the uh, pastors of Ephesus and some of the people they gathered together. Paul was on his way to Rome. They gathered together to hear Paul preach. He gave a reminder of what true ministry is. You read that in Acts 20. Secondly, he gave warnings, and that's also a part of our gatherings in conferences, gave warnings of dangers to come. Be careful, from uh, among your own selves will arise grievous wolves. That was Acts 20. Okay, so now let's talk about the history of conferences as concerns us. You have to understand, my father, Wayman Mitchell, his reference points were Foursquare Conventions. The church he got saved in was actually the uh, we would say like the leadership church, they, his pastors were the area supervisors. So therefore, everybody from the area, basically Arizona, I don't know if it was wider than Arizona, they gathered in my father's home church to have conferences. We actually have a picture of one of the early conferences. And so here they're gathered together. They have a theme. I like that theme. To have is to owe. That was the theme of conference in the square. You see my father on the back row, and uh, they were gathered together. So this was his reference point. You gathered together to hear preaching, and uh, uh, certain things happen. And then his other reference point was conferences of the headquarters of Foursquare Gospel Church, and that was in in, uh, uh, Los Angeles, California, Angelus Temple, this is a 10,000 seat uh, auditorium. I don't think that's actually a conference. I'm just showing you the the building. So my father, that was his reference points, local and their national conference. So what happened at, they called them conventions. What happened at conventions in Foursquare? Number one, it partly involved preaching. Very similar to us, they had various speakers, but my father said the, uh, one of the things that was interesting about preaching was whoever was the current star, if your church was growing rapidly, they promoted you. And their idea was, they didn't look at it like, we have the vision, let's all do this. They said, this guy's growing, so the point was, let the star tell us how it's done. 
And uh, so that, that involved a, a number of very interesting things. If you read Chuck Smith's biography, he's the founder of Calvary Chapel. Chuck Smith, it was his sister-in-law was the pastor of, one of the pastors of this church my father was saved in. And he attended one of these conferences in his biography. He talks about how offended he was and actually began to withdraw from Foursquare. The latest star preacher was preaching and his idea of how churches should grow, he was encouraging pastors to compete. What you need to do is you need to have competitions between churches and between pastors in order. And Chuck Smith talks about that's what he heard at a conference. He rejected that idea. He said that that is uh, wrong. But in conventions, they didn't just hear preaching. Partly conventions were for conducting business. They discussed finances at conventions. They went over and made changes to bylaws, rules of how they're going to govern, and they elected officers uh, there. So conventions involved elections. And that's very true in many denominations. Their conventions, that is when they sort out bylaws. You just saw the Southern Baptist Convention. They made a ruling on women preachers. That's, that's part of what they do. And then they elect who's going to be the president, who's going to be various things. And so my father's experience with that in elections was because people are wanting to get elected, people tended to focus on those that could help them. And so my dad was considered, he was a hick, you know, from a country town. So no one paid attention to him. They wanted to be seen and to connect with people who were movers and shakers who would help them. But these conventions were by and large pastor's conventions. Not many people from local congregations attended. This is what pastors did and they went and they uh, attended. I'll just give you a, a couple of side notes of my experience with conventions, when I was a boy, I went with my parents to a Foursquare convention. I think that, that year was held maybe in San Diego. Uh, the latest star preacher, the latest star preacher, his thing was, I don't want you to feel like I'm preaching to you, so there was no pulpit. He would sit on a stool with cross leg, and, and uh, he would kind of chat. He didn't really preach, and he, he made the statement the, the, the conference was during October, the World Series is going on. He's like, I don't want to make you feel like you're in church. That's kind of a dumb idea to say if you're in church, right? But I don't make you feel like you're in church. He says, anybody know who's winning the World Series? But somebody was listening on the radio. They said, the Dodgers are winning six to three. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to imagine how that would work in our, in our uh, conferences. In Australia... I went to the Foursquare Convention as a voting delegate, and I'll explain, this actually comes a very important part of our history later on. I went, now this is new to me, uh, as a voting delegate, and uh, so they were discussing finances, uh, it's still burned in my memory. They were going over the expenditures of a missionary to Papua New Guinea who had dared to spend $19 on pencils in the last year. And there was a man who was upset. What does he need all those pencils for? So that was, that was kind of my experience with uh, conferences. So our ch fellowship now, we started planting churches starting in 1973. 1973, we had planted uh, uh, two workers out, uh, and then Thanksgiving came, and so it was natural that the two couples out, they came back at Thanksgiving to see their families. Easy, Wickenburg, Flagstaff, it's not a long drive. So they came back, and because they were already here, Dad met with them, and they had some kind of seminar in the morning, very informal. It wasn't, an, you know, planned along in advance. It's like, hey, you're going to be here. Let's get together. And uh, so that was the 
the first thing, and Dad felt that was very helpful, them getting together, fellowshipping, and then a little bit of uh, uh, ministry. In 1974, by that time now, we had um, uh, four pastors, I think, by that time. And so, again, they met in the fall. I'm assuming this was uh, Thanksgiving. But it just so happened that we had evangelist Dick Mills was going to be here anyway. And so, Dick Mills, remember, I've showed you several scriptures on the screen. Very powerful gift ministry. And what Dick Mills would do is he would quote a scripture to, actually a number of scriptures, and would speak prophetically about your future, but it always was tied to scriptures. And so the second meeting that we had, uh, there were a couple of seminars, and Dick Mills gave words. I, I spoke to Harold Warner. He said he remembers clearly, might even still have them written down, numbers of scriptures and this man would speak prophetically. But this was not terribly organized. It was, he's going to be here, you're going to be here, let's, let's uh, meet uh, a little bit. In 1975, John Metzler suggested to my dad, why don't we hold a deliverance convention? And my dad said, what's that? And so he just said, let's meet together, have some preaching over uh, a number of days, and so this is what we did over five days. We had evening services, morning seminars, and uh, John Metzler and Wes Baker. We actually have the flyer of the very first conference, and this was in 19, uh, this was January of 1975. And so you see there the format of conference is exactly as we would do today, but there was no agenda. It was just simply we're going to gather together for the purpose of hearing preaching, calibrating, getting workers uh, refreshed. We actually have some other pictures. Then that went so well. Next picture was July of 1975, and uh, for this, we had uh, uh, Wes Baker and uh, Bob French. Uh, they were the main speakers. And again, we had basically the, uh, the same uh, kind of uh, preaching. We have then some photos of my father. And next here is my dad. With, he had impeccable dress sense. And uh, Matt, that, his, his outfit today reminds me of this. That is, that is awesome. And uh, so here is my dad preaching at night, and here is dad preaching during the day. And so this is uh, uh, what we had. And then we throw in the next picture. This has nothing to do with conference. I'm just throwing it in for free uh, because I'm in charge of photos. So I can. <laughs> I was very, very spiritual at that age. I, I probably was uh, 11 years old, and I was very busy drawing mustaches on conference flyers. So... But uh, anyway, you can get rid of that. So the, the point was, Dad said, this is very helpful. Having pastors being preached to, comparing notes, fellowshipping. So from 1975, we started having conferences twice a year, January and July. Why January and July? Was it because an angel came and revealed? No, hotel rooms in those days were cheap, especially in January, and so it was a natural time to do that. We have some more uh, photos here. The next photo is, uh, this is just uh, announcing, Dad used to put an announcement in the paper of the upcoming conference, and uh, at, at, by this time, this is January of 1976. We had 14 churches. And what is notable, you can't really read it. It's very blurry. I'm getting this off uh, uh, Google, which has all old issues of the courier. But in this, the reason why I'm showing this, this was January of 76, was the first time one of our own pastors preached in the conference. 
Harold Warner uh, preached, I think maybe Ron Burrow uh, preached in this conference. Next, uh, next flyer, here's Harold preaching. I explained to you Harold was uh, uh, in a wheelchair, but here he is preaching in our church. And next picture is this is the lineup. And if I look at that, by this time you see there Harold Warner, Ernie Lister, those were two, Jack Harris, and Walter Portugal and Greg Johnson. So five of the workers that we had sent out by 1976, so 73 we started planting by 1976, here were uh, five of our own workers that uh, none of these had gone to uh, Bible school. One of the very interesting things about our conference from the beginning is our conferences have no registration fee. Typically when you attend a conference, and of course I can't speak for everyone, but it is very common you want to attend a conference, you pay a fee. You pay them for the privilege of attending from the beginning, dad did this opposite. Not only do you not pay to come, we will sponsor you. This was a, a workers who were, were going, uh, the possibility they were disciples, maybe would get planted out. We would sponsor them. We would pay for their hotel room and we would give them uh, some money for food. And so this was a deliberate strategy. My father... In early days of ministry, when, when my parents were struggling and dying the death, they desperately needed preaching, but at times they just couldn't afford to go. And so my father said, I will never do it like that. So we help couples. We, we will pay for conference only by offerings taken. That's it. We will raise offerings to pay, having paid for people's airfares, sometimes their gas money and transport costs to get here, their hotel room while they're here, a nominal amount for, for food. And that has been from the earliest conference unto this day is that's the basis of it. So let's talk about the purpose of conferences for uh, pastors. What, what does a conference do for a pastor? Number one, pastors can be preached to and refreshed. Pastors constantly are giving out. Pastors need to be preached to as well. Luke 8, 46 and 47. Someone did touch, uh, because Jesus said, someone did touch me because I felt power go out from me. Okay, this is ministry. When you're ministering spiritual power, you are being depleted. But in a conference, pastors and wives, evangelists and their wives, they get to sit and receive preaching and be spoken to by God. Joe Campbell said that he was uh, one of the few from our, uh, uh, who pastor for us that uh, weren't trained in-house. He was originally an Assembly of God pastor. He said, I went to conference for years. It was information mostly and rarely did they deal with heart and character issues. He said, I never heard anything that was going to help me practically in my ministry. You have pastors and wives that they can be isolated. When you are isolated, your problems seem bigger. They're, when you're isolated, there are people, they start to go crazy. Some first night of conference, you get people, they come in and their eyes are looking like this. By Tuesday, it's like, ah, I feel better. But this is very, very good. They're refreshed by the atmosphere, sometimes just being in contact with their pastor. From the beginning, Pastor Mitchell encouraged wives to attend. We want the pastor's wife to attend if there's any way to do this. There's a spiritual recalibration that happens in conference. People tend to drift away from our mission. They tend to forget what we should do. They forget why we do it. That could be natural decline. That can be sometimes you get pastors, they're sent by us, and then they start messing around with local pastors and adopting all kinds of nonsense. So when they come back here, the preaching that you hear is to put us on track. Uh, get a picture here of my father preaching. 
at a conference, and this is in the Ruth Street building. Part of the job of the preaching is to put us on track. This is where we came from. This is where we're headed. This is who we are. This is what we're supposed to do. So a part of our conference is altar calls for everyone, not just for salvation. We have a picture here. This is an altar call, uh, early altar call at, um, at a uh, conference. Then we have the purpose of conferences for the people. Again, my father's background, conferences were actually primarily for pastors, not people. Dad deliberately opened it for everyone. And he sponsored people who weren't pastors yet uh, uh, to come. In fact, the term my father used for conference, he called them people's conferences. He says, that is the mark of this. We saw that uh, as the church began to grow, got some pictures here. Remember this, in Ruth Street, our building only actually seated about 600. By the end, we were seating 1,200 in there, and the fire department was not very happy with us. People would wait in line. The service would end. People would start lining up so that they would get a seat. And then the next picture here, I just like this picture. Sunset, I like that. The, kind of looks like the glory of God, doesn't it? Coming over conference. And so one of the great things about conference is people get encouraged and inspired when they hear reports of what God is doing. We have a few pictures here is people give reports. There's an early Mark Olson. Uh, this is Alberto Maleno. That, of course, is in the tent. Next picture. Uh, then some of our own in our building. Here's John Duff, Jake Snyder is we hear reports. Part of the beauty of that is you get to see that's where your money is going. You're giving for church planting. I'm giving you a challenge. And then you get to hear them say, and we had a revival, and we had a, a, a concert, and people got saved. That's where your money's going. That's a very powerful part of uh, the reports. And then people get to see one of the things when people come to a conference, they might be in a very small town, in a very small church, they come in here and they say, wow, I am a part of something that is much larger. And then the other thing is that you get to personalize. I mean, you pray for people's names, you have no idea who they are, and then they give a report. It's like, that's him, which encourages you to pray uh, more. Uh, then there is inspiration for ministry. Conference is deliberately aimed at stirring people to obey God. There's an atmosphere. There's, there's something... There's a reason why we fast and pray before conference because we want conference to be a supernatural atmosphere where people will be challenged for God's will. There's inspiration from the people when they see someone who they know is on their level. If they can do a work for God, maybe God could do that for me. And then we often give a, uh, a challenge for calling to preach in that kind of atmosphere. Our own Stephen Cassio is in a conference he said God spoke to him, and uh, he felt called to preach. That was in a conference. I had a great story. Jake Snyder in 29 Palms, he, he told me a great story. Uh, said that a lady had gotten saved. Her husband was not saved. He was a Marine, but he worked with or was stationed with numbers of the guys from the church. So they were talking about going to conference the next week. And uh, one of them, he's not even saved. And they said, why do you come with us? And so they snuck him in. They didn't tell Bill Brunson, didn't tell me that they were doing that. Just let him sleep on the floor. Imagine this. A sinner came to the Prescott Conference. Brady came the first night. He gets saved Monday night of conference. Tuesday, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Friday, apparently I made a challenge for those who you want to respond to the call to preach. He stood up to respond to the call to preach. And when he saw couples being announced, he went up to Jake Snyder and said, would you send me and my wife out? And Jake said, who are you? <laughs> and he told him, hey, you know, when he told him who he was, yeah, well, you know, talk to your wife and we'll see. So by Sunday when they got there, the wife was saying, pastor's going to be working with us and we're going to be sent out. <laughs> but that's, a, that's supernatural. That's not a program. Only God can do that. And uh, that is uh, what God's doing. So this developed naturally. When we originally were gathering the people, it was just to preach, recalibrate, and fellowship. But it became natural 
that churches be planted out. Started with domestic in the U.S. We plant them out on a Friday night. That is why we have conference ultimately is to plant new workers in the ministry. And then, of course, we began, we'll talk later on about Thursday night international ministry. That is what we continue to this day. You're never going to come to a conference where we're not going to be planting churches because that is our calling. Got some uh, photos here. These, of course, are there is original. There's Stephen Kathy Garfield being launched into the ministry in a very early uh, conference. I don't know if that is uh, Chandler or uh, La Junta, Colorado, two places they went. Next photos then, of course, here is uh, Paul or Renee Stevens, early days when they're going into the ministry, probably Clifton Morenci. And uh, uh, here is our own Jeff and Maureen Day being launched in the ministry. And then that continues, next photos to this day. Oh, there's an early one. This would be uh, couples being sent. I think that's an international night, Thursday night, and uh, couples and Pastor Mitchell's raising the offering for international planting. Final photos. Uh, oh, there's my mom taking pictures of couples who are lined up to go into the ministry and then uh, here praying for the couples as we do to this day. Next, uh, moving on in the photos. And then, of course, to this day, internationally, that's our last conference. Three international workers were praying for those that couldn't even be here, but we do that out of a conference. And then next photos here were some couples that were sent out of our last conference. That is who we are. That is where it came from. And that is what we're going to do until Jesus comes. We're going to be planting churches out of conferences. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you. Amen. We will stop there. And the service will start at 1030. God bless you.